my ambition this morning is that you go away having thought a bit more about gram-negative uh, bloodstream infections. The actions that you can take over the coming months and years uh, as we try and reduce these infections. As you are probably aware, the Prime, uh, Prime Minister, David Cameron, ex-Prime Minister, announced the ambition after the O'Neill report in September to have healthcare-associated gram-negative bloodstream infections. The reason he did this was because gram-negatives are the major driver for antibiotic resistance that we see. Um, they're the major cause of antibiotic resistance in England and worldwide. And they're where we're seeing rising pan-drug resistant bacteria, where at the moment there are increasing numbers of infections that are untreatable worldwide. They're an important source of healthcare association infections, and this is data from the last prevalence survey and uh, an early pre sneak preview of this prevalence survey, which I've been looking at over the last few weeks, shows that it's essentially unchanged over the last five years. So while we've made great steps in reducing MRSA and Clostridium difficile infection, we've essentially done nothing to reduce, prevent, um, uh, gram-negative infections causing healthcare association infections. Everything in reddish colors on this screen are gram-negatives. So more than two-thirds of all healthcare association infections, the causative organism is gram-negative. And the three, um, top three are Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, and E. coli. And even though we think of E. coli as a community pathogen, bacteria that lives in our gut as an innocent bystander, it is still the most frequent cause of healthcare association infections. Obviously, some of those infections may be arising from patients' own bacteria that lives within them, but the infections are caused by the devices, procedures, interventions, or potentially the wrong treatments that we give to our patients. This is a slide which projects uh, some data on gram-negative bloodstream infections. This includes E. coli, Klebsiella, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa bloodstream infections. And what you can see here is that these have been rising continually over the last few years. If they continue at this rate, we'll get to more than 75,000. And we have now more of these three gram-negative bloodstream infections than we did have at C. diff, at the height of the C. diff problem. So we can't just sit back and do nothing. If we look at here, this is a 50% decline in all gram-negative bloodstream infections. That's going to be pretty difficult to achieve as half of all of gram-negative bloodstream infections arise in the community. But halving the healthcare-associated component will bring us down to below 40,000 over the next four years. So why should we focus on this? Well, the rate in E. coli has been increasing the rate's highest in the elderly, but the number of bloodstream infections is the same in the under 75s as the over 75s. So we need to do interventions on both groups to reduce infections. And mortality is important. So the number of healthcare associated um, infections the, more, uh, the mortality at 30 days for healthcare association infections in general is estimated between 5,000 and 10,000 in the UK based on the last prevalence survey. If we look at the causative organisms where we look at E. coli, MRSA, MSSA and C. diff that are collected by uh, Public Health England from the data capture system, there are 15% to 20% of people die within 30 days of these infections. Putting that into perspective, the same number of people die from those four infections as breast cancer every year. But we're not shouting about this, and we're not doing enough to prevent it. Preventing the infection once it's caused a bloodstream infection is quite difficult. But preventing the infection, getting to a bloodstream infection, is much more possible. See, E. coli causes 1% or is associated with 1% of all deaths in England each year. And why is this important when we talk about antibiotic resistance? This is data from Oxfordshire that was published a few years ago now in JAC, but the story continues to be the same. 
The rise in E. coli bloodstream infections is largely predicted by the rise in antibiotic resistant bloodstream infections. So the more antibiotic resistant bloodstream infections that we have, the more cases that we will have as well. The actual rate of non-resistant bloodstream infections has remained rather static over time, but the rising resistance has seen that more bloodstream infections. And you may say, why is that? Well, I think it's because the patients don't get a bloodstream infection de novo. They often have an infection before that, usually a urinary tract infection, maybe a surgical infect site infection. And those infections are not being treated adequately to prevent the bloodstream infection arising. And resistance is increasing. So this is data following on from that slide, looking at piperacillin tazobactam, which is our number one antibiotic used for sepsis in England uh, right now. And we can see that E. coli resistance has gone from 8% to 12%, and Klebsiella pneumonia from 12% to 18%. That's a significant rise in resistance over the last five years. And what can we do to prevent it? Well, this is data from 2011-2012, uh, when the E. coli system started. Data from approximately 35 NHS trusts who participated in sentinel surveillance. Now, a lot of this data we should have available on more patients that are from the data capture system, but we, this data is really poorly completed. Maximum of 35 to 40% of patients have the underlying source of the infection recorded in the database. But in this, there was 98% recorded, and what's quite clear is the urogenital tract is the most common cause of underlying infections. Hepatobiliary comes next, and then followed by gastrointestinal tract. Everything else over here is quite rare. I wanted to point out that E. coli bloodstream infections are extremely rarely uh, a contaminant. If you've got an E. coli bloodstream infection, the patients are sick. 15% are unknown, and these are relatively going to be preve unpreventable because we don't know what the cause is, so we can't prevent the bloodstream infection. But within everything else, there are elements that we can prevent. And people talk about E. coli being a community infection. People throw up their arms and say, there's little we can do here. But actually, 50% of patients with E. coli bloodstream infections in this sentinel surveillance and in other studies have had a healthcare exposure in the month prior to the bloodstream infection. What does that mean? Well, that means there was an intervention that we could have done better to prevent the infection. Obviously, 25% of them arise after two days in hospital, so therefore there was a period of at least two days in the organization that you could prevent the infection. And those patients are the patients that we can target easily within hospital settings. However, within community settings, we need to look at the underlying causes. We need to see what interventions they've had in the previous four weeks to devise better interventions. To move it just from looking at E. coli to gram-negative bloodstream infections, this is a study done by approximately 10 organizations in England where they looked at all comers of gram-negatives, 679 consecutive gram-negative bloodstream infections. And really, this is to show consistency. What you can see here is that E. coli is the largest cause, Klebsiella comes next, then Pseudomonas, and then everything else. So there's a logic about picking the top three. And what you can see here is that there were sick patients and that 54% of all of these patients were defined as healthcare associated infection and a quarter as nosocomial, i.e. more than day three after onset in hospital. High mortality consistent with the national studies as well. And I, as you can see, there's a significant proportion of these infections caused with the urine infection with a device being a urinary catheter and similar association across everything else, with no clear source being very small numbers. So what were the key healthcare events in this large sentinel survey of more than 1,700 patients? Well, one of the commonest interventions that we saw that people were getting antibiotics in the previous four weeks. So they were already having an intervention, but that intervention was frequently not the correct antibiotic for the patient, either the correct and choice, the correct dose, or the correct duration. The next most frequent 
was they had a urinary catheter inserted, removed or manipulated in the seven days before. It was one in five patients. So one in five patients, we have a direct opportunity to interact with the patient and improve catheter care. Other devices, particularly central venous catheters or other prosthetic material, was 7.3%. And other procedures were 12%, predominantly surgical procedures. And we've talked at times before, and I was talking earlier with Celia uh, uh, about the idea of prostate biopsies. Prostate biopsies are a rare cause of bloodstream infections, but nonetheless, something important that we can do to interact and intervene to prevent. Looking at those antibiotics in more detail, I think this is a key driver to improve care of patients, to prevent hospital admissions, uh, and to ensure that patients get the right treatment at home. If we look at those patients, over half had received one antibiotic, 23% had received two, and some had even received three or more antibiotics in the previous four weeks. So plenty of times to intervene and get it right. And the most common treatments were for the urogenital tract. And the most common treatments that were given for the urogenital tract were trimethoprim or pomoxiclab. As people will know, the national guidance has changed. And the reason the national guidance has changed from trimethoprim first line is that in the samples that we receive in NHS laboratories, 40% are resistant to trimethoprim. Those symptoms, samples have biases in them because they're often sent on the clinical failures than rather than the first sample. But even with the biases and in samples that were taken that without any biases, at least one in five urinary tract infections these days are trimethoprim resistant. So unless you know the result is tri the, of this urine test is that it's trimethoprim sensitive, you should be considering alternatives, such as nitrofurantoin um, and other antibiotics as according to the guidelines. 14% had received prophylaxis. So the question is, was that prophylaxis correct? Are we giving the right prophylaxis at the right time to prevent these infections? Some people might say, well, actually, you know, what we're doing here is, is uh, there's a problem. We're asking everyone to reduce their antibiotic use and as, along with reducing their antibiotic use, you want us to reduce infections. And what I'm trying to do here is demonstrate that what you can see is that the more antibiotics you use in CCGs, the higher the rate of bloodstream infections. It's a bit converse to what you might think of. But what that means is that higher, play, higher antibiotic use is driving resistance, is more likely to have clinical failures from the first line antibiotics, and that you need to be more thoughtful and use less antibiotics and better and more correct antibiotics each time. Trimethoprim is still and remains the first line treatment, and we'll hear later about the quality premium uh, for uh, gram negative UTIs and thinking about how we'll move trimethoprim to nitrofurantoin and reduce antibiotic use in the elderly as two key interventions. Looking in more detail on the urogenital tract, one in five, as I've said, have had a urinary catheter inserted, removed, or manipulated in the previous seven days. And in looking at the causes for that catheterization, one in five patients, it's unable to find the cause for it to have the urinary catheter in. 10% a urinary catheter for incontinence. So both of these are preventable, removable reasons to have a catheter. Urinary retention and fluid balance are two recognized reasons for having a urinary catheter in, but those indications should be reviewed on a daily basis. It's important to say that it's not all long-term catheterization. Short-term catheterization matters, and short-term catheterization is predominantly driven by hospital use whereas long-term catheterization is predominantly driven in the community. What we can do is look at both, and we can drive down both types of uh, catheter use. We have data on who's using catheters. So this is data from the safety thermometer, and we know that in hospitals, one in five patients at any one time have a urinary catheter in. And that's pretty much stayed static for the last five years. This is data from the safety thermometer, which is selected patients. It's almost identical in the prevalence survey, where we've surveyed more than 50,000 patients twice over a five-year period. And in both of those surveys, the urinary catheter prevalence is unchanged and close to 20%. In those people who have catheters in their own home and have community healthcare involvement, either by district nurses going in or helping them with their catheter, 8% have a urinary catheter in situ. 
and one in 20 people in her care home have a urinary catheter in. What we know is, on any one day in hospitals, one and a half percent of, of patients have a catheter-associated urinary tract infection. If you multiply that up by the duration of a catheter treatment being seven days, and you look at the whole population within the NHS at any one time, that's close to a half a million urinary tract infections caused by catheters in the NHS every year. The other important area that we need to think about is surgical site infections and our surgical site infection priorities. These are the areas that we've traditionally looked at and have been part of the mandatory surveillance for surgical site infection. And what you can see is the rates of infections for, for orthopedic procedures is remarkably low. We know that. They're a clean operation. We're doing something that the patient is going to benefit from. They're predominantly elective procedures. And that's where we have focused on reducing the infections. We need to think about shifting our focus. These are the annual surgical volumes for large bowel and cholecystectomy. Remember, gastrointestinal, surgical site, and hepatobiliary were important. And what you can see here from the national data is the high rate of surgical site infections in these populations. This is much, much higher than published rates of surgical site infections from studies, which suggests that surgical site infection rates is about 10%. The estimated number of infections are here, and the cost to the NHS of just those two infections is more than 100 million per year. They are also the biggest drivers of gram-negative infections, having gram-negatives living in our bowel and our hepatobiliary tract. But we do very little surveillance on them. And for organizations where they, they do these procedures, one should think about whether moving their surveillance priorities inside the organization should consider these high volume, high rates of infection, high cost procedures. What other interventions we can do? Well, this is a study demonstrating that actually looking at urinary catheters in a multimodal approach, doing what we know and, and do every day, but in an effective manner, can reduce infections. You need to train staff. You need to come up with urinary catheter reminders. You need to think about surveillance and feedback and all of this to look at urinary catheter use and the incidence of catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Just driving down urinary catheters will drive down infections. And you can see that you've halved infection risk by reducing your number of infections. So you can get your infection risk by, down to half by reducing your catheters. This is data from um, fingertips looking at E. coli by clinical commissioning groups. And what this is highlighting is that there's a large variation in clinical commissioning groups. And I wanted to pick out two that I looked at and thought were interesting. Why are some clinical commissioning groups much higher than the national average for the rate of E. coli bloodstream infections and continuing to increase? Do CCGs look at this data? Are they actually considering what the causes are? And why are some getting better? We need to learn from organizations like this to see what they have done to reduce their infection rate over time. And in the NHS, we're very good at taking things up and running with them, but we need to learn better from our partners. And one of the days like this really help us. Um, this is showing the similar amount of variation in NHS trusts. So how can we fit all this together to reduce gram-negative infections? Well, we need to think about everything from the outcomes, beliefs, um, motivation to comply, external factors, to change our behavior, to introduce tactics to prevent infection prevention and control. And these are multifactorial. Financial incentives or indicators are important, but they're only effective while they're in place. We can think about decreasing the number of infections and admissions to hospital and increasing prescribing in line with the guidance. And for those that don't know, those are the two key indicators that we're looking at in the quality premium for clinical commissioning groups next year, reducing um, bloodstream infections and increasing antibiotics. So in summary, gram-negative bloodstream infections are increasing at about 10% a year. There's a high 30-day all-cause mortality. The underlying causes of bloodstream infections are urinary tract infections, predominantly catheter-associated, 
surgical site infections and devices. And that's where our interventions need to drive. We need to focus on prevention of the underlying cause by improving treatment of urinary tract infections in the community and preventing nosocomial infections. They have a high cost to the NHS. Every single case of, of urinary tract infections costs an order of a thousand pounds for at least an admission to hospital for three days. And bloodstream infections up to 20,000 and on average 3,000 pounds. Data is available and we should use data effectively to improve that we monitor and change our practice. This is the PHE fingertips portals, those other portals that are available as well. But as data comes online, we will try and display all the data that you need to monitor your practice in this one place. All of this wouldn't be possible without all of the people and departments listed on this slide. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you.